Hi guys, today we're going to talk about 3044 presumption and in context of domestic violence restraining order. Family Code section 3044 states that the perpetrator of domestic abuse has to come back to court and rebut the presumption that he or she can have joint or sole legal and physical custody of the child who is protected or the other parent is protected from domestic violence, rebut that presumption and be um, and, and have joint legal custody. So the court must consider what's in the best interest of a child. And that code section states in order to rebut that presumption, the perpetrator has to um, comply with uh, for example, um, has to be has com has to complete better intervention program. Has to complete courses that were either assigned when the initial restraining order was uh, given to the victim, or if it wasn't assigned, usually it's automatically assigned um, in a temporary restraining order, fifty two weeks of better intervention program. But in a permanent restraining order, the court can say what's what needs to be done in order to rebut the presumption. If nothing has been said, then the perpetrator is better uh, off doing some courses to show some, some rehabilitation, such as better intervention program, therapy. And also the court will consider if the perpetrator, after the restraining order was served, violated this restraining order. So. If the perpetrator violated the restraining order, the court will be more hesitant to say you are rehabilitated and can now have joint legal and physical custody with the other parent who is the protected party of the restraining order. So the court has to state the reasons in writing once the presumption is rebutted. And when court considers best interest of a child, it's such a vague term and, and very overused what is in the best interest of a child. So it is actually defined in code section 3011 and 3020 California Family Code sections. Now, one element of what's in the best interest of a child is consistent and continuous contact to both parents, which means it could be we will come better later about the gender and sex. So both parents, um, if one parent is absent, for example, the perpetrator is absent, not voluntarily because the other parent asked the court and court granted move away, move out of the apartment order or the house, or the parent voluntarily relocated, um, involuntarily relocated. So in those cases where the parent voluntarily relocated or is absent and has not tried to connect with the child, the court will say, well, maybe that parent is not ready yet to come back and get, be given the rebuttal of the presumption because based on action violated the restraining order, it has relocated and absent and hasn't tried to connect with the child. So I had cases where um, a parent who was who got the restraining order and supervised visitation decided to not exercise the supervised visitation because it was too annoying, too expensive, uh, too uncomfortable to have supervisor write reports. That parent will have so such a hard time to come back and say, well, I now completed 52 weeks of better intervention program, but I haven't exercised any parenting rights. So the court will have to consider best interests of a child factor that this parent was absent to this child. Second element as part of the what's best interest, what is in the best interest of a child is contact of siblings, to both siblings. So there was a case in 2001, a case of appeal, Williams, California case of appeal, where a lower court ordered each parent, four children, two children each. And court of appeal, um, didn't agree with this order and said that the parents are not al the court is not allowed to split the siblings. It is in the best interest of a child to have connection 
to both uh, to all siblings. It's um, it's it's defined in wealth, welfare and institutional uh, expression and, and code uh, as a public interest that siblings should be kept together whenever possible. Of course, there are exceptions uh, if there are any medical, emotional, or educational needs that would prevent that from happening. Third element, the court would look at whether or not the parent who comes back to rebut the presumption is using controlled substance or alcohol. Habitually continuous use. It is defined in code section 3041.5 where the court actually has the authority. So at the beginning, it was so that the court didn't have a constitutional authority to put someone under, um, uh, under testing conditions, meaning uh, supervised random 10 panel uh, urine testing for cases involving custody. And then legislature put this into a code section and now the court does have an authority to, um, to have one parent undergo or two parents undergo testing for illegal, uh, illegal, right? So right now we know marijuana is legal, so illegal use of controlled substances. And the, the same section, subsection A, A says even if the test is positive, it's not automatically a reason to, uh, to make detrimental adverse custody decision. So no, uh, the court also doesn't have authority uh, to, to order follicle test. The court has to do, quote, least intense method for drug testing. In, 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 in again, in quotes, in, conf, in conformance with federal employment procedures and standards. All right, so when considering best interests of a child, we also have to look at, the court has to look at um, to ensure that there is no discrimination, that the, the court cannot discriminate another parent because of their sexual orientation, of their uh, gender expression um, or, cons or, or discriminate based on gender. So the court has to treat both parents equally. Now, child's preference. In considering child's best interests, a child's preference is also a factor. A child uh, in sufficient age and capacity to form an intelligent decision, court must, not may, must consider and give due weight in the child, the, to the child's wishes, case by case. What does it mean case by case? The court has to balance protecting the child. Basically, if the child gives um, an opinion, then it could be given in the form of declaration, putting the child uh, as on the stand to testify. And so the, ch the court has to protect the child. It's, it's, it's pretty um, probably devastating for a child to sit in, and testify against another parent and give preference to one parent versus the other parent. And so the court has to balance the due process right of the parent who is now being Mm, scrutinize. For example, parent says, I don't want to be with that parent. That parent has due process right. Due process right means that that parent has the right to cross-examine the child and to question the, to, to question the, the child's testimony. So there was a case, uh, a Rosson case, R-O-S-S-O-N, case of appeal, California, where the court determined that the child was the, the child was very mature and it was the age between 10 and 13 where the child preferences was considered. Since then, this case has been uh, disapproved by another court, but it hasn't been uh, decided on a Supreme Court level. So if the child is older than 14 years of age, the court must consider child's preference. If the court is, if the child is under 14 years of uh, age, then the court may consider 
child's preference considering all these factors, maturity, uh, the balance test. But interesting enough, in both of these cases, the court looks always, always what's in the best interest of a child. And if the court does not want to consider a child's best, um, doesn't want to put the child on, on to testify or let the child's declaration in, then the court is required to offer alternative means to get child's input. It could be through child's advocate, it could be through mediation. In San Francisco, it's called tier two evaluation where a mediator will speak to the child directly. And um, it is defined in code section 3042E, family code section, in California rule of court 5.113D. Actually, 5.113. 113D. So I hope this video was helpful and I will see you soon. Bye.